In this video, we'll cover chemical bonds, electronegativity, polarity, and isomers. There are two types of uh, chemical bonds, ionic and covalent bond. Ionic bond is an electrostatic interaction, and this is the strongest type of bond. So whenever you have an ionic bond, this is considered to be a strong bond, even stronger than covalent, okay? Ionic bonds, they do exist between the groups 1, 2, 3, and 5, 6, and 7. For example, if you're doing a bond between sodium and chlorine, here I drew the, um, the number of electrons or the valence electrons of sodium because it's a group 1, it belongs, it has one electron. Chlorine, group number 7, it has 7 electrons. So in order for chlorine to be octet, it requires a transfer of electron. See, one electron, this is why I am using a half head arrow. So it requires a transfer, not a share, a transfer of electron from the sodium to the chlorine, so that chlorine is octet. When this happens, chlorine will be a negative charge, because right now chlorine will have eight electrons, and um, this is a full orbital, or, orbital and therefore the chlorine, um, it's octet. And then sodium will lose electrons because an electron was transferred from the sodium to the, to the chlorine in there. So you will end up having an electrostatic interaction there. You will end up having the charges on the sodium and on the chlorine. The charges are very important, and this is how we represent an ionic bond. An ionic bond is an electrostatic interaction, so there is no way that we can draw a line or a bond, an actual bond between the sodium and the chlorine. It's not a bond, it's an interaction. The point is that any um, compound that starts with a with the groups number 1, 2, and 3, or a transition metal um, in there, this is going to require the formation of an ionic bond and not a covalent bond. And if this is the case, you have to represent it in the form of the charges in there. Let's say, for example, if we have something like this, um, if we have a uh, sodium, and next to the sodium we have an oxygen and the CH3. The moment I start with sodium, sodium is a metal, so I know that sodium is a plus charge. So this is going to be the positive part of the molecule. This means that I will have a negative part of the molecule. The negative part is going to be everything else. That negative part is going to be on the oxygen. So this is why when I want to represent sodium and oh, CH3, it is called sodium uh, methoxide. It's a base. This is going to be represented in a form of um, electrostatic interactions, negative and a positive charge, and not a bond between the sodium and the oxygen. So pay attention to that. Ionic bonds are normally formed when you have a huge difference in electronegativity, meaning that the electronegativity between the metal and the non-metal. So because you have a uh, interaction between metals and non-metals here. So the difference in the electronegativity between the metal and the non-metal is greater or equal than 1.9. From where are you going to get the electronegativity values? You will be given the electronegativity table. So you don't have to worry about um, memorizing any of these electronegativity values in there. So if you want to determine the type of bond, whether it is a polar covalent, non-polar covalent, or ionic, all what you need to do is figure out the electronegativity of, uh, between, uh, between the elements. So you look at the electronegativity between sodium, between an oxygen and there, and see if the difference in the electronegativity in absolute value, in absolute value, the electronegativity of sodium is 0 0.9 from the table, um, minus the electronegativity of the oxygen is a 3.4. So you put this in absolute value in there, okay? You put this in absolute value, so your answer is always going to be positive. And if that is greater, it is actually the 1.9, then in this case, it's going the, the type of bond is going to be an ionic bond. If the difference in electronegativity is less than 0 0.5, it's a non-polar covalent, and it's between 0 0.5 and 1.9, it's a polar covalent. 
in the exam, you are allowed to have these two tables. You're allowed to have this table here, and you're allowed to have this table in here, in addition to the VASPER table. So in exam one, you will have three tables, the VASPER, the electronegativity, um, and the electronegativity difference table. Ionic bonds, these are the strongest types of bonds in there. And these are all examples of ionic bonds. Whenever you do um, you present an ionic bond, please make sure that you uh, show the positive and the negative ions. The positive ion is uh, simply called a cation. The negative ion is called an anion. Now, as we proceed, you are required to know the names of uh, these ions. And the, these molecules, this is called sodium hydroxide, OH minus is a hydroxide, Cl minus is a chloride. When you have one carbon next to the oxygen, this is called a methoxide. And when you have two carbons next to the oxygen, this is called an ethoxide. So that is, will be named as the metal first, which is sodium, and then you name it the negative part. Okay. There are, uh, of course, when you represent an organic molecule, it's not necessary that you just have one carbon. You will end up having a chain of carbons. So to make it simple on ourselves, we just use the general term R. So what is an R? R is simply a carbon chain. The carbon chain can be either two carbons, a three carbons, four carbons, five carbons, and as you go. So when I say an OR, this is a general example of an alkoxide um, having X number of carbons in the R chain. And here I'm giving an example of one carbon. It can be two carbons, it can be three carbons, and so forth. Of course, the positive part not always is a metal. It can be also a polyatom as well. We already know that nitrogen, when it has four bonds, it's a positive charge. So if this is the positive charge, then you're going to end up having the chlorine to be a negative charge. So immediately you need to know that the type of bonding in there is an ionic bond. You can also do the electronegativity of the nitrogen, the electronegativity of the chlorine, put them in absolute value, it should be greater or equal to 1.9. To be an ionic bond for covalent bonds. Covalent bond requires the um, the sharing of electrons. So ionic bond requires the transfer of electrons. So one electron will lose, the other will gain. This is what ionic bond. Covalent bond, no, you are sharing the electrons. So here, a uh, hydrogen has one electron, and the other hydrogen has one electron. So these two electrons will be shared and you will create a single bond, which is called a sigma bond, which is basically a covalent bond. Covalent bond is a strong bond, but it's not as strong as the ionic bond. Normally, covalent bonds, they happen between hydrogens, between diatoms. So a hydrogen, a chlorine, a bromine, so they happen between the same elements in the periodic table, and they also happen between nonmetals. So covalent bonds, they happen between uh, non-metals, okay? Ionic between metals and non-metals, covalent between non-metals. Whenever you have a carbon, definitely this is going to be a covalent bond. So um, elements of carbon with hydrogens, oxygens, nitrogen, sulfur, and phosphorus, all of those are non-metals. Okay, so these um, are going to involve a covalent bond in there. And as I said, it involves sharing of electrons. Um, covalent bonds can be polar and can be nonpolar. So please follow the table in order to determine the polarity of the bond by simply checking out the electronegativity. In there. Now, with respect to the bond polarity, never ever determine how polar the molecule is unless you have the geometry and the shape both so you should have the geometry and the shape um, represented 
on paper. So for NH3, we never determine the polarity of NH3 by simply drawing the Lewis structure for it. No, you have to convert it into a molecular shape. So you don't do this. You don't draw just the Lewis structure of NH3 and determine the polarity. Your answer will be wrong. You want to position the bonds where they're supposed to be um, in, the, uh, in space. So this is why you would need to draw it as a trigonal pyramidal in this case. I missed here drawing the hydrogen behind and the other one is in front. So please correct that. Okay. So draw the geometry and the shape before determining the polarity of the molecule. And then go with the electronegativity. Electronegativity increases from left to right in a period and from bottom to top in a group. So uh, whenever we are working with a hydrogen and nitrogen, nitrogen is more electronegative. So if it's more electronegative, it's going to pull the electrons towards itself. This is the uh, definition of electronegativity. It's the pull of electrons. So nitrogen will pull the electrons away from the hydrogen, leaving the hydrogen what? Lacking electrons. And now all the electrons will be concentrated on the nitrogen. So to represent that, we represent it by this arrow, which is called the direction of polarization, where it uh, shows the flow of electrons and how it's going. It's going from the hydrogen to the nitrogen. So now the hydrogen will be uh, losing electrons and the nitrogen will be gaining electrons. A positive sign is a sign of losing and a negative sign is a sign of gaining this is why when we draw the arrow, um, when we draw the arrow, we show like a, a small positive sign at the bottom of the arrow, just telling that this element in here is losing electrons and this element in here is gaining electrons. And these are partial charges, which are represented by the direction of polarization. So each one of these hydrogens now is losing electrons. and the nitrogen is gaining electrons, so it's partial negative. So notice how the direction or the movement of electrons is all towards the nitrogen and going up. So the dipole moment is not canceling out, so this means that it is polar. Another way is to the electronegativity of the nitrogen and the hydrogen in absolute value, and you're going to see it's a polar covalent bond from the value. Carbon dioxide, please draw it as a linear, because it is linear, and then determine the polarity of the molecule. Oxygen is more electronegative, so the oxygen will pull electrons. Always the head of the arrow is the negative part. The, um, the, the back of the arrow is going to be the positive part. So oxygen is taking electrons from the carbon, making it electron deficient. This is represented by a positive charge on the carbon. Same thing over here. The oxygens are the same. So this is why the pull of electrons on both sides are going to be the same. So this is why they're going to cancel out and the molecule is nonpolar. It's just like because the oxygens are the same, it's like the pull is going to cancel out. Nothing is going to move. And polarity is the movement of electrons. So as long as the electrons are moving, the molecule is polar. Once the electrons stop moving, then the molecule is not going to be polar. Same idea over here. Because the chlorines are the same, you have no movement of electrons. So the dipole moment is equal to zero. For the tetrahedral, because all the hydrogens are the same, the arrows are going to cancel out. So these two are going to cancel out, these two are going to cancel out. So this is why the molecule is single bonds. The length of the bond depends on um, the hybridization. So single bonds are the longest, and the triple bonds are the shortest. The shorter is the bond, the stronger is the bond. Why is that? Because um, if you take a look at the nucleus, the uh, closest orbital to the nucleus is the S orbital. So the more S orbital you have, because S orbitals have also electrons, the closer the electrons are to the nucleus, and that will make the bond shorter. We're looking at the sp hybridization. The s orbital constitutes half of the total orbitals in here. So the s orbital constitutes 50% s character. Here, the s orbital constitutes one third 
of the uh, orbitals, which is 33% S character. And here the S orbital will constitute 25% because it's one fourth of the total orbitals. So it's going to be 25% in there. So because the SP has the highest percent of the S character, this means that the S orbital is so close to the nucleus. And if it is very close to the nucleus, this means that the bond or the triple bond is going to be very short. The shorter the bond, the stronger is the bond. We can also relate this to the hydrogen. So if you have a hydrogen connected to an sp hybrid carbon versus a hydrogen that is connected to an sp2 uh, versus a hydrogen that is connected to an sp3, then the easiest one to be break, the easiest bond to be break is basically the uh, bond between the carbon, the sp3 carbon, and the hydrogen. This is the um, this is the uh, weakest bond, and the carbon-hydrogen bond of the sp. This is going to be the stronger bond, so it's going to be harder to be uh, broken. Constitutional isomers. These are compounds that have the same molecular formula, but they have different connectivity of that. And um, they are also represented by a Lewis structure. So let's say if I give you a, a molecular formula of C2H6O, and I ask you, go ahead and draw the Lewis structures of C2H64, C2H6O. Um, one student might connect the two carbons and then end with an OH. Another one can insert the oxygen between the Two carbons in there. Notice these are not uh, these are not resonance because the connectivity of atoms are different. These are called structural or constitutional isomers. In there, um, one of those is an alcohol because uh, this is an alcohol functional group, and we will talk about this in chapter three. The other one is an ether because you have an oxygen between two carbons, and that is called an ether functional group. All of these names you will be familiar with, and we will discuss them in details in chapter three. So um, these are going to be the two constitutional isomers by definition. Constitutional isomers are isomers that carry the same molecular formula, but you can write them differently. And every time you write them, you're going to get a different name. Now, in order to draw uh, constitutional isomers, you would need to follow the following steps in there. If you are dealing with a hydrocarbon, meaning you have carbons and hydrogens in your formula, you don't have oxygens, okay? Just carbons and hydrogens in there. Then in this case, there's a possibility that you can have either single bonds, double bonds, or a triple bond. Alkanes have a molecular formula of CNH2N plus two. Alkenes or cycloalkanes, they have a CNH2N, and um, the alkynes have a CNH to N negative 2. N is the number of carbon. So these are the molecular formulas that I want you to memorize for the different types of hydrocarbons in there. Now, um, if your molecular formula that you are given in the question follows any one of these formulas, then you can easily relate and know what type of hydrocarbon you have. Alkenes have at least one double bond. Alkynes have at least one a triple bond in there. Now, uh, let's say, for example, if you have oxygen in there or nitrogen or a halogen in your formula, then in this case, it's not going to be a hydrocarbon. So it's going to be hard to know how many double bonds and triple bonds you have in your structure. So this is why you would need to do a, a degree of unsaturation calculation. And this is called a double bond equivalence. And it is a formula that we use in order to determine the number of double bonds or cycles that exist in our structure. Uh, there are multiple formulas. I am using one of them. If you know another formula, you are welcome to use it. But my formula is the number of carbons in the molecular formula times 2 plus 2 minus the number of hydrogen divided by 2. This you need to know. So, um, if you have oxygen in your molecular formula, we're going to ignore 
either oxygen, sulfur, or phosphorus, just ignore them. However, if you have a halogen in your formula, you add it to the hydrogen, and if you have a nitrogen, you subtract it from the total number of hydrogens in there. Okay, so let's say, for example, if I have, instead of the oxygen, if I have a chlorine in there, then my total number of hydrogens will be 6 plus 1 of the chlorine, so it will be 7. So you're going to substitute the 7 here. And if instead of the oxygen, I have a nitrogen, then you subtract the nitrogen from 6. So I will end up having 5 hydrogens, so you're going to go ahead and put it in here. The, um, the equation is pretty much simple, and um, the outcome is going to determine how many degrees of unsaturation we have. Degrees of unsaturation, they are defined by a cycle, a double bond, and a triple bond. So if your dB is zero, we know that we have all single bonds. We don't have a double bond. We have, we have no cycle. So a dB of zero, this means that in our structure, we have all single bonds. A dBe of 1, meaning that we have either one double bond or we have one cycle. A dBe of 2, as we said, a double bond is a dBe of 1, a cycle is a dBe of 1. So it's going to be a combination. So it's going to be either two double bonds, two cycles, or one double bond and one cycle in there. Also, it can be a triple bond. A triple bond is a dBe of 2. Now, uh, to draw the isomers, you have to do the DBE first if you don't have any of those molecular formulas in your equation. And we will do a lot of examples on those starting from chapter 3. Um, after you do the DBE, then we're going to start by drawing the straight chain, the straight carbon chain. We call it an N chain. Then we're going to take one carbon and move it along the chain. This is called the branches in there. And if there are any cyclic structures, we're going to go ahead and include those, assuming that the DBE is going to be greater than one to include the cyclic structures. Here we're going to keep it simple for the first chapter, and uh, we're not going to consider um, neither double bonds nor triple bonds nor cycle. So we're only going to consider alkanes, meaning a DBE of zero. So this is an alkane, this is a CNH2 and the plus two. We don't have to do DBE for this one because we know that it follows the formula CNH2 and the plus two. So we move along with the rule in there. So the moment that you um, know the molecular formula, know, know that this is an alkane, draw your straight and a chain. And your straight and a chain is this one over here. Don't draw the carbons straight, Please throw them in a zigzag as we mentioned. And then we're going to take one carbon and move it along the chain. Now, when you take one carbon and move it along the chain, since you are beginning at this, go ahead and number your carbons. I'm going to take carbon number one. So if you take carbon number one, it's already on two, right? So we're going to go ahead and put it on three. So if we put it on three, then we're going to end up getting this structure. You can easily see that this structure is different than this one. But both, they share the same molecular formula, which is C4H10. You cannot do anything else, because if you take one, carbon one, and you put it on carbon four, it's going to be exactly the same as this structure. So these are the only two isomers for C4H10. For C5H12, again, this is an alkane, because it follows the C Cn h 2 n plus 2. So draw your end chain. It has a dB of zero. You draw your N chain in there. Number the carbons, as I said, over here. You're going to do this because um, it's easier for you at the beginning, but then you're going to get to it. Um, take carbon number one and move it along the chain. So we're going to put it on carbon number three. We're going to get a different structure. Now, if you take carbon one and put it on carbon number four, it's going to be the same as carbon number three. So um, if if you do this, these two are the same. They are exactly the same. Um, and because they are the same, don't write uh, don't write them again. So don't write the molecule again. 
Now, um, after taking one molecule and moving it along the chain, now we're going to take two molecules and move them along the chain. So if I take two carbons and uh, put them on one carbon, then I'm going to end up getting this highly branched structure. So these are the three structural isomers for C5H12. Notice that the number of structural isomers for alkane is less than the number of carbons. C6H14 is another example that also follows the, uh, um, the molecular formula of alkane, CNH2N plus 2. So draw your N chain first, and then take one carbon and move it along the chain. So we're going to take one carbon, and we're going to move it along the chain, move it around this carbon, this carbon, and there. And then take two carbons, move them along the chain. They can be on adjacent carbons, or they can be on the same carbon. Please do your um, extra problems that are posted on eCampus. With respect to the uh, isomers, we will have uh, additional problems, and we will hit on this topic again in Chapter 3.